Welcome to the Technical Writing Stories, the series where we dive into the journeys of those shaping the world of technical writing. And today we're excited to have Nolan McBride with us. Uh, Nolan is a technical writer at Career Plug with a fascinating background that spans from uh, the medical industry to software development and extends into the world of podcasting. So, uh, Nolan, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm super excited to hear your story. And uh, I'd love to start with uh, listening about your background and how you got into technical writing. Thanks, Victoria. And I'm really happy to be here. Um, yeah, so uh, if you would have asked me when I was in college if technical writing was on my radar, I would have said no. Um, I was very preoccupied with uh, being an English major. Um, I was kind of, um, uh, it, it was the thing I wanted to do regardless of whether it was a good financial decision because, you know, the English majors can either be a great fit anywhere or they can be, you know, sometimes their skill set ends up being uh, lost to employers. They don't know what to do with them. They're just too generalized or something like that. But I thankfully, um, was smart enough to pursue a professional writing minor. And that got me exposed to some tech, technical documents, some more formal documents, and um, got me a couple internships that let me you know, work uh, in real environments and, and test out my writing that way, which was very helpful. Because um, prior to that, you know, everything was a essay that I would submit to my teacher, and that was kind of it. So this was the first time I was able to have a real audience with my work. Um, and yeah, that led to a job in marketing. Actually, um, my first job out of college was with Victoria's Secret Direct. And I used to set up like the uh, promotional offer codes for the website. Um, so very different thing, not really technical writing related, but it did still have um, some of the hands-on experience that it would, would play a big role in, in what I do now. Um, when I moved to uh, Texas, I uh, ended up working in reports for a little while at this uh, EMSI, which is a medical records retrieval company. And um, through the course of working there for a couple of years, uh, my boss just started to notice that, you know, I would take on work that would be documentation work for us or something that was just needed cleaning up or revising or made, you know, branded to look nice or whatever. Um, they would send those to me and then eventually they realized, hey, we should focus on this the whole time. So. I was offered my first technical writing role there, which I'm incredibly thankful for because, again, I don't know that I would have ever pursued it. But once I got there, I realized it was kind of a, a perfect fit for my skill set, my personality. Um, you know, even there, I learned that I'm a bit of a convergent thinker, which I don't love. I didn't love learning that about myself. Uh, you know, if, if you're not familiar, convergent thinkers tend to like gravitate towards a single solution or look for a single solution rather than, you know, going for a wide array. And as someone who thinks of themselves as a creative person, it was a little bit disheartening to hear that, um, you know, I, I may be narrow-minded in some way. And I think technical writing sort of brings that all into view for me and that like, I am a creative person. I like doing creative problem solving, but I love being able to work with a group to still things down and reach a point where we agree like, hey, this is the thing we all agree upon. This is what it means. Um, just sort of like distilling something down to its simplest form uh, is something I really enjoy. So um, that's kind of the basic how I got here. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and really interesting to hear also about how uh, learning about your personality can help uh, shape your your next steps in into technical writing and just understand how uh, how that like the best next steps are. Uh, and you also mentioned that uh, you had no idea you're going to get into technical writing when you first decided uh, you're going to get a, a bachelor's uh, of arts in English, and that uh, your minor helped uh, on this on this process too in professional writing so that's that's uh interesting to learn about and so so would you say that your role like uh your time at uh, emsi and having that uh can we call it maybe a mentor there that helped you um make this transition from a marketing role 
into into technical writing was would do you consider that like the big part of of uh, your transition in, into technical writing uh, having this person that helped you you shape uh, shape your your next role um in this case i would actually say probably not just because um again the the role sort of sprung out of something that was needed and it's not something that the company had ever focused on before. So I wouldn't mm -hmm. say that I had a mentor in the sense of another writer there who was sort of helping me. Um, but I ended up working like really closely with the CEO of our division and, uh, and not in a negative way, she had very high standards. So that was very helpful for me as far as like getting a quick guide to like, okay, these things need to meet this certain standard. They need to be this organized, this uh, well presented. And I think having these sort of key important audience helped me get that feedback that I needed early on. Yeah, that's interesting. And I bet there were many challenges on this first role, uh, just uh, learning about the, the role, like what it is to be a technical writer and not having another writer there. Uh, that's, that's not an easy uh, transition. So can you tell, tell us a bit about the initial challenges on this role? Yeah, so um, I mean, that's a lot of companies, uh, in my experience, so a lot of companies don't have a dedicated technical writer. It's not always something that is that is valued at a company. Um, but, you know, obviously a little bit biased here, but having worked in it, I think it is a really crucial role because what it does do, again, is it you have so many processes and procedures in your company, whether you, um, again, like my old company retreat medical records or my current company, we develop software. Um, you have so much that you need to keep track of people, you know, work moves so quickly. People tend to not want to take the time to sit down and, and write something out and really s explain it or just sort of document it for posterity. But, that stuff will come back to haunt you as, you know, questions or missing gaps in content later on. Like so much of that stuff, just it gets lost. But um, I would say, you know, a lot of what I um, dealt with here was like not having, um, I had to develop a lot of the initial sort of standards for our, for the writing there. Like there was no, uh, like I mentioned, there was no other person sort of guiding me. So, um, I was working, you know, from my English degree, I had, you know, knowledge from there. I had a good handle of grammar and, and sentences and sentence structure. Um, but you know, one thing that comes up a lot in technical writing is questions. You have so many questions, um, because in most cases you're not the most you may not be the most knowledgeable person on any particular subject, but you have to be able to quickly learn them and then learn the right questions to ask. But when you don't have, like I mentioned, you don't have someone else that you're necessarily going to for advice on how do we structure these types of documents? How do we want to handle, you know, basic things like, you know, font, uh, headings, all sorts of little things like that. You have to make all of those decisions. And so, yeah, quickly you'll sort of learn like, you got to establish some sort of standardization so you can have consistency for yourself because that's one thing that's really important too is is being consistent like you're never going to be perfect across the board but the more consistent you go you are the more likely you are to sort of reinforce the things that you are trying to teach your audience um and so you know a lot of what i was i, I basically took on a lot of very different stuff there um i think i might be dipping into your next one of your later topics but um you know, I, I did everything from revising our corporate policies and procedures um, and even ended up sort of recreating the template for that. Um, I draft and sent like department wide communications to over 200 employees. Um, and some of these were just like basic, like keeping them in the know about what's going on in the department. Some of them were for events that we were trying to entice uh, employees to come to. Um, I built workflows. Uh, so a lot of those were like, to visualize processes and procedures for different people in the department, um, creating instruction manuals and guides for various work functions, and then um, combining our, like, we have like a monthly check-in where 
I got information from many different departments, had to combine all of those into a single PowerPoint, make them, you know, consistent, concise, and also, you know, match with the intention of the person who wrote it was. That's that's something that comes up a lot too, is that you're 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 frequently representing someone else's work or you're representing something else for someone. So on the one hand, you want to get in there and learn it yourself, but you also have to make sure you get that feedback from the end user that the work is doing what it's supposed to, that it's teaching me how to how to do something or that it's imparting some sort of understanding. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, thank you for for uh, sharing that, like about the types of documentation as well. And um, it's interesting when you when you step into an, a technical writing position uh, on a company that didn't have this role before uh, you you at the same time that it's very challenging because you have to set out this this foundation and create all the processes is also very rewarding because uh, you get to to shape how the technical writing the uh, or even like uh, as it grows like the entire department may look like in in the future so uh it's it's an interesting position to be at for sure yeah yeah there's a certain freedom in it mm -hmm. and you also mentioned about uh, learning about about topics uh there are two different things right uh, learning about the um, uh what it goes into the processes of technical writing and also learning about the subject uh, that you that you have to write about and all um and that changes as you change, if you change the, the company or the industry, there's a lot of learning involved in your roles. And stepping into this uh, technical writer position at uh, EMSI, you were already inside the company. So you had some, uh, you had a base of the knowledge uh, of, the, of what you were writing about. Is that right? Is that how it went? Mm -hmm. Though I would say like I, Prior to that, because I was really focused on reports, I didn't have a ton of knowledge on the like, for, inst for instance, if I was creating like an instruction manual for a particular role, I wouldn't previously have a lot of knowledge about what that role did or how they did their specific work. So in that case, I would have to sit with somebody from who, who was that role for, maybe it was a day, maybe it was a week, and I would shadow them you know, writing down every single thing they're doing, and then I have to take that back, recreate it for myself, I'm going to have some gaps there because, you know, it's not, it's never a one to one transfer, uh, transfer of knowledge. And then that's when I would bring it back to someone and say, Hey, does this, does this match what you do? Did I capture that correctly? Yeah, I see. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, and now transitioning into your current role uh, at Career Plug um how how is uh how does your role look like first and i'd also like to learn about the tr the transition and how uh you uh how the knowledge part uh, happened uh, from talking to subject matter experts and uh to doing your own research and how how was that process for you yeah so um career plug uh, it was a very different experience because they're uh, they're a software company, and so we have you know an app that I can actually get in there and use myself. Versus, again, in most cases for EMSI stuff, I would not be in the the system that most uh, employees did their work in. I wasn't in there from day to day because that's not where I did my work. And so this is very different. Where we all interact with the app. We all have demo accounts. We all have test accounts so we can get in there and play around. It's it's a much more hands-on experience for me. This actually, again, maybe like I mentioned, harkens back to when I was at Victoria's Secret because this sometimes uh, hits a similar point as um, I had to do a lot of testing for offers at Victoria's Secret. So that's like, you know, going on the website, shopping like I'm a customer, putting it through various test scenarios to make sure it's working as intended. So in the same way, I'll go into my demo or test account at career plug. And, you know, if a new feature is coming out, I will try, I will, you know, walk through the feature with my demo or test applicants. Um, and then, you know, make sure everything is working as intended. And then in this case, if it's not, I have to go reach out to a subject matter act 
such a subject matter expert. Um, so when I'm my department or my product team, um, reach out to them and just see if, you know, the experience I'm having is a bug or if that's the intended experience, or if it's maybe just the, um, the early experience while it's in a test environment, there's a lot of those things you have to figure out and, um, make sure that what I'm ultimately putting in our help center articles is going to be representative of the product we put out, not of, you know, the various, uh, sort of like weird environments that I may have, uh, figured that out in. Um, so yeah, it's a lot more hands-on. Um, I also think and this will be biased because I work here, but I think our app is pretty intuitive. So again, it was, it was very easy for me to just jump in there, get a sense of what I'm doing, get a sense of, you know, how to navigate the app, how to use the app. Um, all of that for me felt pretty simple. So then a lot of what I'm doing beyond that is just really getting into the specifics and really also getting into um, was like beyond instructions. I think the other thing that like uh, technical or instructional content needs to include is, is sort of uh, value propositions, reminding, reminding people why it's important, not just like from a product perspective of like, oh, we want people to understand why our product is valuable, but from a, uh, why am I reading this article right now? What value is it giving to me? I need to always be reinforcing it. Like, Hey, if you're reading this, there's a purpose. I'm going to tell you something. I'm not going to waste your time. I'm going to give it to you as quickly as possible. So you can go on with your day instead of, you know, reading, spending a ton of time reading help center content. So, um, and yeah, as far as is the type of work I do, I'm pretty focused on, um, help center content. So I, I own and manage, uh, all of our help center content. We have, I think 350 articles, over 350 articles in our main help center. And we have another help center for a different segment of clients that has about two thirds of those articles. Um, some of them are, are different. Some of them are almost, some of them are ident identical. And so, you know, that opens up complexity a lot too, where I've got a lot of information. It's, it's well organized, but now I need to make sure I'm updating it in all the right places. And if, you know, I might have a, one segment that has something, but another one doesn't. So I'm only going to update it in one of my help centers. Um, there's just a lot of, uh, a lot of plates to keep, uh, spinning and also keep in check, uh, as you're, you know, managing a lot of content. So. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Uh, could you share like some, uh, what, what are the, if you use any sort of te tools or technologies specific to, to this, like t how do you keep uh, the content updated and if you reuse content, how does that go? Yeah. Um, as far as specific technologies, uh, I don't use a ton. I do, I mean, I do use Grammarly to check my work, but it's not like, a. we don't, we don't tend to take that as the end all be all. It's not like what Grammarly says goes as with most mm -hmm. writing, it's a, it's a conversation between what we agree upon as far as standards and the choices you have to make in the moment. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll make exceptions, but Grammarly is a great tool for sort of checking myself. Um, there's a couple other readability tools I use. Um, I think Hemingway is one allows you to sort of see, uh, if your work is reaching people at the right reading level or seeing like the reading level of your work to make sure that you're sufficiently making it, uh, readable for a wide audience. Um, because, uh, you know, it's going to vary by your industry, but most technical writing, um, this feels like a broad generalization, but I would say like a lot of technical writing should be for a general audience. You're generally writing for, um, the person that doesn't know very much about your product because you, you don't ever want to assume knowledge because that's where you, that's where you'll lose someone who's reading your content. You'll, you'll assume something, you'll, you'll skip past something and they go, wait, I, I missed that. They get lost. And so, yeah, you really want to aim at the widest available audience, really make sure your work is readable. So um, things like Grammarly, Hemingway, there's a couple more out there that are, are good. But um, yeah, those are the main technology I use. But um, I do, re I mean, you said reusing content. That is something I try to do for consistency sake. So if, if, if I've taken the time to, to write something out and we've gotten to a place where we feel like it's clear and concise, 
if I know I'm talking about that topic in another article, I'm not going to spend the time rearticulating it and maybe doing a worse job. I'm going to go find my previous work, copy it, bring it over, or maybe even just link directly to that article. Um, because in a lot of cases too, what you're doing, well, again, this, this more applies if you're building a help center, but um, you're building like a, a collection of knowledge that should link together. So you're, all of these little pieces should build on each other. So that's why you do things like linking to different articles so that people can easily move between different topics and sort of build upon them themselves. But um, besides that, as far as technology, um, I don't think there's too many other tools I use like that just because, you know, again, a lot like you can find tools that will, um, I know there's like screen recorders that can sort of re record what you do and spit back like basic instructions. And that's definitely helpful. But I would say that's also not what technical writing is by itself. Like I think mm -hmm. there's, there's yeah. a tendency to assume it's just writing out the instructions, but it's really a little closer to instructional design where it's like, yeah, the instructions are important, but it's how you organize the instructions. It's how you lay all of that out, how you add emphasis, how you add extra little notes throughout that, again, builds into something that's bigger than just a one, two, three, four sort of walkthrough. Um, yeah, 100 yeah. percent. And you touched on a very important point, too, which is linking uh, within like your own content. A big part of technical uh, of a technical writer's job is to make sure that people are going to find the content that they need. So it's mm -hmm. not only making sure that, OK, I have uh, I have this topic here outlined, but uh, where is my reader going to go next? Like, what is their next need? And all of that, this is this is very important. Um, so thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. And um, in your view, like right now, uh, with your current role, or maybe as a as a general, uh, in a in a general sense of being a technical writer, what would you what would you consider uh, like a very important skill, like for those that are watching and are trying to develop their their careers as a technical writer? Yeah, um, I mean, the the one that sticks out to me a lot, and, and part of why I found myself gravitating to this work is is uh, detail orientation, like emphasis mm -hmm. and focus on the details. That is something I've always had, whether it's, you know, helpful or not, you know, sometimes you can be pedantic about things, but like details matter and they really matter in this work because like I mentioned, that's the details where you lose or keep somebody in the article and keep them engaged. Um, how you get those, I would say though, is, and this maybe this is the bigger uh, thing I would say to work on, which is like, uh, empathize with your audience, which which might sound like a weird thing at first, but you really need to put yourself in their shoes as you're going through things because you shouldn't be thinking of this from you. Like you, you sort of need to divorce yourself from what you're doing and just try to imagine yourself as somebody else doing this for the first time who doesn't know what you know. Um, and then you can go back and add that more nuance uh, later. But again, you really want to just you're trying to anticipate their needs. So you really have to put yourself in their position. Um, think about them like that's audience is kind of the thing I think about the most with technical writing um, is knowing your audience and making sure you're reaching them. So again, empathizing with your audience, getting in their shoes, anticipating their needs, I think is, is something that's going to go a long way to helping you. Um, and then I'd say like be a, like, you know, a hands-on learner um, because that is what a lot of this stuff will be. Like you're obviously going to have access to hopefully subject matter experts who are going to, you know, guide you through things, help you understand things as well. But you, you're you going to do a lot better if you're someone who likes to get in there and play around and you know, break things and see how they work and really understand them for yourself. So um, I'd say approach everything with a curious mind. Uh, because again, questions are, are going to be one of your biggest uh, assets as a technical writer, even though sometimes that's going to feel uncomfortable or you're going to feel like you're bothering people by asking too many questions. But if you have that question, surely 
some customer or client you have will also have that question. And they will very much appreciate if you thought that through and put that in the content for them so that they don't have to, you know, reach out about this one particular thing. They were able to use the help center article. They found what they needed. Um, and they're, you know, they're back to using the app rather than calling in or something. Yeah, that's a really good uh, advice. Great point. So uh, knowing your audience uh, attention uh, to detail and well, in, uh, still on knowing your audience, if you're able to put yourself on the shoes of the audience, use the product yourself, because the questions, uh, the, the things you come across are likely going to be things that your audience will, will need to, uh, to have information about. So yeah, good points there. And speaking of skills, uh, you, it's clear that you also embrace the, the, the creative side. Uh, notably through hosting your own podcast. Uh, could you tell more, more about, uh, tell us more about this project and how this maybe intersect with your career uh, in technical writing? Yeah. Um, so when I was actually thinking about this for, for our talk, I did sort of realize that the podcast appeared, um, I think, or kind of around the period where um, there was a, a departmental change at EMSI when I was still there. So I stopped being a technical writer again at a certain point because that role didn't exist anymore. Um, and so I think the podcast sort of sprung up when I was having a little bit of a lack of uh, creativity at work because I, I'd switched to a more um, like an analyst role. Um, but, uh, you know, some of this just came from, um, but well, again, my appreciation of, of, of um, I guess we'll even say horror movies in general. Um, I'm a big fan of horror. Uh, horror often gets a bad rap. There's a lot of derivative horror. There's a lot of, uh, you know, copycats. And so the whole kind of premise of the podcast came about of like, um, there it really is only, there's a, a saying, you know, there's only four or five stories to tell. It's really about how you tell them. And so for me, the, the podcast is about showing that every idea can be tackled more than one way and approached in a completely different way and you get a completely different outcome. So it's about, there is a sort of root connection between the movies that we talk about, but then ideally they should be very different besides that. And it's, it's all in the different stylistic choices of the filmmakers and the actors. Um, and I don't know, it, it was funny too, realizing this sort of ends up being a, almost a rebuttal to the thing I learned about myself being a convergent thinker. The podcast is about, no, there's always more than one way to do it. You can do things multiple ways. Um, and I think maybe that even speaks to a little bit the creativity that I find in tech, technical writing, which is that um, it, it sort of comes in the problem solving and the finding ways to say something in a different way. Um, so what, with a lot of technical writing, like a lot of the creativity I see in the editing. So it's, you know, you've got to get something as clear and concise as possible, and then also make sure it's, you know, understandable. So there's a lot of, you know, rearranging words, a lot of cutting words, and, or, you know, I take a lot of content from others and, you know, reformat that for help center stuff. It's a lot of reshaping things. So, um, I guess the the point of that is to say is like um, it's worth exploring that you know things appear in multiple different forms and uh, there's value in in doing something different ways and having a variety of approaches. Yeah, hundred percent. And uh, where where can we find your your podcast? Like uh, if we want to for the audience wants to check it out, can it's, you um, can you share that? Yeah, yeah, it's it should be on iTunes. It's on Spotify, and I think pretty much all the other major podcasts. It's called Dead Ringers because again, it's it's about two two movies that appear identical but maybe have something very different at the core. So, um, yeah, you can find us on any of those uh, major places. But I would just say iTunes is usually the place to go. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have another question uh, about. Uh, 
AI, so like technology, uh, like with the advancement of, of technology and AI spe specifically in this, this last uh, couple of years, uh, did you feel that changing your role specifically, uh, did you uh, change your approach or what's your take on that? Yeah, so um, I, I've i used a couple, I mean, I've used some AI tools before, but I don't use them a ton. Again, just if only because in a lot of cases I have some pre-existing content to work with that I'm usually modifying rather than starting from scratch. But um, yeah, AI is definitely gonna be, I think, impacting our profession specifically. I think there will definitely be businesses that want to, like I mentioned earlier, sort of go with the line that technical writers are just writing base instructions. So, you know, we could get an AI to do that. We don't need that. But again, for me, what's so important about technical writers is really shaping and framing and organizing the content and making sure that it is achieving the objective that we want. So, um, yeah, I think, I think it's going to be impossible to avoid AI going forward in the future, but I think, you know, making sure that you are focusing your skills on the right things. Like I mentioned, thinking about your audience, thinking about how you structure content or organize content, um, like that's gonna help you, you know, have, an, have something to offer beyond what AI can do. Um, and then, yeah, I think in most cases, this is, you know, AI is a starting point. It, it might be, able to, you know, you can use it to get like sort of a draft of things or a rough idea, but the the real work, I think, of a lot of technical writing is in editing. And so I think, you know, it can help you get started, but I think you still need to do the work yourself, if, if that makes sense. Um, I think it's also important that, you know, as much as we can, we're not, we're not using AI to replace people. We're using it to we're using it to automate, you know, sort of rudimentary tasks that aren't, uh, you know, that just take a lot of time. And so I think having that balance of making sure you're, if you're using those tools, you're using them, but you're still making sure you put a personal human touch on all of those things. Um, I think that's really key. And, you know, um, yeah, I would just, I would just say, don't, get too reliant on it, but you know, don't be afraid of it either. Yeah, I love that. I, I totally agree. And it's the, uh, a key piece there is a, a big part of the technical writer's uh, job is in editing. So um, it's definitely a big help with, uh, with as a starting point, but it, it does not replace the work of technical writers. Yeah. And um, yeah, as we wrap up the the conversation, uh, you shared a lot of uh, a lot of valuable advice already. But is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience? Anything uh, in particular we didn't we didn't cover? Um, I think I said these, but again, I, if if I'm repeating them, it's just because these are the things that I do really think are the most important, which is um, just approaching subjects with curiosity and with fresh eyes and and not assuming knowledge, not assuming you know the most about it. Um, or again, maybe you even do know a lot about it, but if you can, for the moment, assume you know nothing, that will give you a different perspective and make you think of different things that you weren't thinking about when you were just going through it, you know, like you would day to day. Um, and then I mentioned this multiple times, but thinking about your audience, the audience is like the main thing I think about um, with my writing. and. It, it can be challenging because we have multiple different types of clients um, who have, you know, potentially slightly, ver slightly variant uh, versions of our app or like, you know, some features might be there. And so I have to make sure that I can talk to everyone at the same time, which again, that's very difficult, but you have to be able to sort of conceptualize these audiences and make sure that you're speaking to them directly rather than just, you know, focusing on one or in ignoring the other. You really have to think about everyone as you're putting this stuff together. Um, and I would also say like, I, I don't know if you got into this without this, but I would say if you're a technical writer, I would really suggest you do it if you're someone who likes helping people. 
um, because that's kind of how I ultimately think of it. Um, I'm also like a baker. And so some of this, some of my thoughts on this come from that, where it's like, I'll use a recipe. There's one instruction missing and I will get so hung up on it. And that will, you know, that might completely ruin the recipe. It might make the recipe better. It might do something like that. But what I like to do is like, well, I want to be able to do this better next time. So I want to make this as clean, as clear as possible. So I'm going to go and write this all out so that the next person who comes behind me can, you know, do it better than I did it. And so for me, it's like, it's all about building a knowledge base so that everybody can use it. Um, and so everyone can enable themselves and improve themselves. And yeah, I just think if, if you're not interested in that, maybe you're not as interested in technical right? I don't, I don't want to dissuade people, but I just feel like there, you should be drawn to want to help people because I think that will really help, um, help you focus as you're going through it. Like it'll help you think of the right things. It'll help you prioritize the right things. So. Yeah, I agree with that empathy. Like you, you have to, you have to be able to empathize, empathize with your audience and want to help them, uh, through writing. So yeah, great, great advice, Nolan. Thank and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Thanks that was, me. that was amazing. Uh, really good, uh, advices. And I loved, loved to hear about your story. And I hope our audience enjoyed the episode as much as I did. Thank you for everyone who joined us today. And uh, that's all for now. Be sure to join us for the next week's episode. And uh, yeah, that's a wrap. Thank you, Nolan. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.